So salt burn. It's a smooge. If you live in Michigan, I believe this is a Michigan brand. Here's your tri ah, shit. It's carbonated. <coughs> Just a mess. Like salt burn. What I was going to say, is if I'm not mistaken, Smooge is an Ann Arbor brand. It's a hard smoothie. Anyway, starting the day off strong. Hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. Not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? Happy Saturday. And on Saturdays, I talk about <laughs> Let's start off good news, bad news 2024. Bad news first. I'm probably gonna do my makeup a lot less this year. Why? because of the good news before you start yelling at me. Because this year I really wanna focus on making more in depth and longer and better videos. Like more research wise, there's so many rabbit holes I go down, but I don't have time to make videos on. There's so many shows I watch that I'll never have time to make videos on because it's like six, seven, eight, nine episodes of things. Did you know that there's Tubi series? I'm watching one right now, it's terrible. It's like Law and Order, if they never fully finished an episode, <laughs> it's terrible. And if I do my makeup in every video, that makes that less and less likely to happen because it takes up more time to film, takes up more time to edit. I also have editors now. What, what? I hope I never have to edit again. Put something cool here. Whatever you want. Go nuts, go crazy. <sighs> Watch, they just cut that out. <laughs> But yeah, 2024, we're doing more interesting videos because I have a lot of interesting things that I go down little rabbit holes wise and hopefully you'll join me for the ride. With that said, I still have a bead on. This is a good lip, isn't it? Before you ask. The lip is Makeup Forever Artist Color Pencil. Versatile chestnut all over the lip. And then the Roman Blur Fudge Tint in number four. Hate Koreanized English words because I'd rather you just say it <laughs> in whatever it was supposed to be. Oh, Radwood. Oh, Radwood, Radwood. Oh, I would have never got that. I don't even really know what that is in English, <laughs> but it's very pretty. Side note, I also have a code with YesStyle. I never bring that up. <laughs> I forget. Anyway, it'll be down below if you want to get a few bucks off. Yeah, so that's the update. I'm gonna be doing my makeup less on screen, but the videos will probably be longer and hopefully be better, so. Join me for the ride, because I have a lot on the plate right now. I also did another video, which is technically a video about seven different movies. And I can do that now, because I have time. <laughs> now that we have all those pleasantries out of the way, we can discuss the topic at hand. So Saltburn. Uh, Saltburn has been on the list for a while. People have been asking me to watch this for a very long time. If you've lived under a rock and have not at all heard of the movie Saltburn, it is a 2023 movie that came out, uh, I wanna say in November. And I've just been hearing this very disturbed and confused and disgusted buzz around it on social media. And I um, was talking to a friend of mine who who had actually seen it and he was also vocalizing how disgusting it is and I was like oh so I shouldn't watch it on this flight I'm about to get on and he said wouldn't recommend it I don't think <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea at all so I didn't do it on the flight there <laughs> but I may have done it on the flight back when I was writing the script for this which may be worse because that means I've already seen the movie once and still decided to, to watch it on the plane. <laughs> but you know what they say, the grind never stops and neither does capitalism or bills. So with that said, let's send it over to Admiral Kenny. <laughs> that was smooth, oh my God. Hello everyone, this is Admiral Kenny and today's video is sponsored by ThreadUp, the online thrift store that has only the good things about thrifting involved and none of the bad. Nothing but the joys of buying things secondhand, limiting environmental waste, saving a few bucks, finding unique pieces, plus the additional benefit of it being organized online and therefore you don't have to go rummaging through musty bins and dusty shelves in order to find what you're looking for in your size, that's your style, that's in the price range you're willing to pay and the condition that you're looking for. You can also organize by brand. And for the last like year or two, my favorite brands to shop from are Pretty Little Thing and Cider. And all I have to do is search under those brand names and I can find stuff that I would have purchased anyway, but on discount. And if you're my viewer, you can get an even bigger discount if you go and use my code KennyJD40 to get 40% off additionally, 
plus free shipping. Again, it's a great way to save time, money, find some unique pieces, find something that you'll really enjoy without having to take a trip to a thrift store and fighting off people in those dusty shelves just to find a shoe that don't match the other shoe and one fit and one don't and now you say it. Could have just went to Thread Up. Big thanks again to Thread Up for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. So I went into this movie pretty blind, not as blind as I would have wanted to. Again, there was a lot of hoopla online about how disgusting <laughs> and just revolting certain aspects of this movie is. There are two particularly disgusting scenes that I was not lucky enough to have heard nothing about before seeing the movie. And I feel like that is a big part of why maybe the movie didn't hit as hard as I feel like it may have hit other people for me. One scene, arguably one of the more disgusting scenes was pretty much entirely spoiled for me, which I'm really upset about. Cause I, again, think it would have hit harder. And instead I was a less disgusted that and more curious why. <laughs> so, and I'm kind of annoyed about that. If you are able to watch the movie without any preparation or forewarning, do it, I think it's funny. And then you should tweet me about it. You'll be upset. You'll get over it, probably. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know your story. But yeah, I think because I had some things minorly spoiled, the movie's a lot, but I expected it to be a lot worse. I don't know what that says about me, but I, I guess it says something, I don't know. It could also be accidentally, incidentally, I happen to be working on two videos that are about pretty graphic shit. <laughs> Starting a bit heavy this year. Not next week. Next week, we're talking about cheerleading. <laughs> but one of the videos that I'm working on right now is doing a bit of a analysis, a deep dive, if you will, on American Psycho, both the book and the movie. And I guess after reading the book, I was primed for something much more sexually violent and graphic. What the f was that book, man? Because I've seen the movie, I'm going off topic as usual. Um, I've seen the movie a million times. It was funny. It was kind of funny, wasn't it? Book's not funny. It's not, it don't, well, it, it was funny the first like 200 pages because it was like, what the f going on? And then it just got real bleak real fast. Those second 200 pages were rough, man. <laughs> anyway, this movie is f***ing weird. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's f***ing weird. Um, very art people doing sh type energy. That doesn't make it bad. It just, it's just weird art people sex shit. And I don't hate it. <laughs> this is not referential, by the way. This isn't blood on my hands. <laughs> I just, I've been playing around with makeup and I only have one hand painted, ignore me. Anyway, for those of you that are uninitiated, Saltburn is a dark comedy psychological thriller set in the early 2000s, around 2006, about an Oxford student named Oliver Quick. And Oliver is definitely a fish out of water at Oxford. The school is pretty well known for attracting prestigious and affluent students. Ooh, this is stronger than, I, what the f is this percentage? It's 5%, wow, okay. But yeah, Oliver has a lot of trouble fitting in. That is until he meets one of the students named Felix. And he's definitely a real alpha to the cuck. <laughs> Oliver, you know, he's rich, he's tall, he's witty, all the girls like him. And he also seems to have this kind of inexplicable, I hesitate to say the word attraction, but he's definitely drawn to, because when I say attraction, doesn't it sound like romantic? And arguably there is a romantic vibe. It's hard to tell if it's both ways or one way, it's, it's weird. But he definitely has like a fondness for Oliver to such an extent that they become friends. And during the summer, he offers for Oliver to come to his family's estate, Saltburn. Salt, Saltburn. I'm British. And thus begins a <laughs> disturbing and confusing romp within the life of the wealthy, kind, and vapid. Kind? No, I wouldn't say kind. I would say superficial. They're not kind. They're actually pretty mean, uh, generally speaking. I'm thinking of the mother in particular, but when I first started the movie, I asked Twitter, is this supposed to be like mean girls, but gay? And eh, kinda. <laughs> it's definitely a, a catty herring becoming queen bee type of energy, but uh, it, it's, it's more like bride's head revisited, which actually ends up being referenced a little bit in the movie itself. So it's very aware of that likening right there. But yes, overall, it's a blackly funny story about the desperation of the middle class, pawing for upward social mobility, envy, 
greed. And sure, sex and debauchery is definitely how we illustrate those themes and emotions. But the premise itself seems pretty universal and pretty straightforward. And with that said, I liked the movie. I don't think it's the best movie ever made. I think it's a solid well, I'll do my reviews later. But I like the movie. Do I think it will be everyone's cup of tea? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. And there is this, you know, overall atmosphere that's quite off-putting. There's a queasiness. It's a very beautifully made film cinematography-wise. It has a very particular feel. Something of a foregone era. You know, something British from the 20s or like the 60s. Or just before... <laughs> it is wild, but surprisingly, despite how weird things get, it's able to stay just under like absurdist or campy. But it is at times very, very funny. So I, it's an interesting balance. I actually quite like it. Very skew, very disconcerting. So that's my spoiler free uh, uh, spiel. And if you would like me to hold your hand, this is where we're going to talk about Sultan. Because I know a lot of you guys didn't want to watch it. <laughs> you waited for me to watch it. I read your comments. You sacrifice me all the time. I love you. Yeah, this is Saltburn, 2023. So again, the movie begins with our main character, Oliver. And in the opening scene of the movie, we see him sitting to the side, talking to someone off screen. And he's talking about how he wasn't in love with him, whoever this him was though everyone thought I was. And then over a very romanticized montage, we see moments of Felix, the him in question. And we are told by Oliver that Felix was loved by everyone. And it was hard not to love him. And especially the girls, they just wouldn't leave him alone. He was just so attractive and everyone just liked him so much. And maybe that's why he liked Oliver so much because he kind of gave him space to breathe, you know? But Oliver is like, sure, I loved him. But was I in love with him? And that ultimately, in some ways, a question of Saltburn, of the intentions of Oliver as a character. We are transported back to 2006. Absolutely ghastly year. I started my period. People were leaning with it and rocking with it, whatever the hell that means. It was just a mess. I don't remember when Lean When It Rock when it came out. I just wanted to say that with a British accent. <laughs> but we are following Oliver as he enters his freshman year at Oxford, surrounded by this indistinct chattering of those of higher social and financial standing than him. And the first thing I noticed is that he's definitely giving 29-year-old Harry Potter realness. He definitely stands out in a negative way. He quickly uh, takes sight of Felix. But rooting hot 20. <coughs> oh, f I haven't done that in a while. But rooting hot 28 year old teenager. Yes. It's our boy Jacob L. Ordy. I don't know why I say his name so stressed every time. It's just a weird cluster of, of consonants for me. If you don't recall, we've had him on the series quite a lot. Um, he was in our kissing booth debacle. And now that I say that, I haven't done the brooding hot 25 year old teenager thing in a very long time. Felix is popular. We've established that, right? That much we can deduce. And that is like obviously juxtaposed with Oliver, who is forced to befriend this weird dude whose name, I don't know if they even said, but it doesn't really matter. He doesn't show up much in the movie. He has very little impact other than him just screaming. Um, at one point in the uh, in the mess hall, not the mess hall, the lunchroom. I'm a genius. I don't even like maths, really. I can just do it. Ask me a sum. Nah, you're okay. Mm. Come on. No, I believe. Ask me a sum then. He's just lovely. But the next day, Oliver goes to his counselor or tutor or something, and he's supposed to be having this along with another student who is late. When this student comes, he is a American named Farley. Farley. He's definitely a kid from money whose parents sent him to stay at Oxford with his British side of the family. And immediately you can tell he's a bit pandering, needlessly combative for some reason. So I'm sure he'll be a treat. <laughs> but later, while riding his bike through the campus grounds, Oliver runs into Felix, who seems to have gotten a flat. And so he offers him his bike so that he can get to class because he was already late. And this is their first meeting and they seem to befriend each other quite quickly because Felix, he's a very charismatic guy. He's very, you know, enthusiastic. He's one of those people that kind of says, I love you to everybody, which is admittedly to me a bit disconcerting. But, you know, some people are just very expressive like that. And he's like, I love you, mate. I love you. And then he takes his bike and he's like, I've been 
repay you, man. I'll, I owe you one. Oliver, I love you. I love you. I love you. So one night they're all drinking at the bar and Felix sees him kind of sitting with the weird guy and he's like, oh, I'll repay you with a drink. And the drink turns into shots with Felix's friends. Um, and eventually he's pressured by Felix's friends to buy them all around, but he doesn't have any money to do so. But Felix is there to help him with that. And ultimately this is the beginning of many situations in which Felix helps Oliver feel more a part of the group at Oxford, feel less alone and be a friend to him. So that's good. And because of this, Oliver begins to be quite fascinated by Felix, growing closer to him in a way that isn't what I would call platonic, but not overtly sexual either, at least at this point. We find out that Farley, the American, the black one, and Felix are cousins. And Felix's father is actually paying for Farley's schooling because his mom, I don't know, did something with all their money, so they don't have any. But Felix's dad is willing to pay for him to go to Oxford, so. Some other things that we learn <laughs> is that apparently, as I had said before, Felix claims that his family was the basis for Brideshead Revisited. We learn that Oliver is a bit elusive about his past, particularly in reference to his family, his parents. He doesn't have any siblings. His parents and him aren't close because they seem to have had some vague mental health addiction issues. As time passes, Oliver and Felix tend to get closer and they become better friends. With that said, despite them being friends, it doesn't necessarily rub off on Oliver as far as like being confident and a ladies man. Like that's one thing that Felix is definitely the man in that department. He could basically go up to any woman and be like, I want you. And they like, oh, you want me? And then, the, you know, it's yours for the night. And we're gonna get hot tonight. Girl, give me your number. Forget it, here you my number. Forget it, you don't need my number. Cause we're gonna get hot tonight. That song ain't even that old if we're talking about it's 2006. The British people at Oxford had never heard of new edition hot tonight. <laughs> But anywho, the weird dude, noticing Oliver's growing friendship with Felix, goes up to him and warns him that Felix will grow bored of him, which made me go, mm, okay, all right. Well. This is definitely not what we see from Felix as of this point. He tends to defend Oliver when he's, you know, speaking with the other status-seeking weirdos at Oxford, even when he doesn't know that Oliver is there. He invites him to things when they don't want him to go. He's, he's you know, standing up for his friend. But again, as things go along, his attraction is quite sensual, if not sexual, okay? There is a sort of obsessive bite to him, Oliver. He seems to always be watching, kind of looming over him as Felix gets laid for instance, he tries and fails to have sex with one of the girls that Felix has hooked up with. She was looking to make him jealous. And then Oliver's like, I don't think he'd even care. And then she's like, the only reason I'm sleeping with you is to make him jealous. And so she just leaves. After Oliver gets a call from his mother, Oliver goes to Felix crying, saying that his father has passed away. And Felix is like, if you need to take time off, this is a very difficult time. You can miss exams if you need to. And this is, you know, definitely a situation where we see that Felix and Oliver live in very different worlds because Oliver is like, this is all I have. I can't miss exams. And so he grits his teeth and continues with school going into the end of the year. And by the end of the year, largely due to Felix, Oliver has a bit of a friend group now. They say hi to him. Farley goes up to him and says that he's almost passing, which I can only assume is to mean that he's passing for not poor. I don't know, which is wild to say, considering your mama f***ed away all your money. So, okay. Felix pulls him away at the end of the year celebration or something. And he says to Oliver that he would like to throw a stone in the river with his father's name on it, because in his family, there's a tradition that whenever someone dies, they do that. They write their name on a stone and throw it in the river. And so Oliver goes to do that, but misses and throws it into someone's vomit on the street. But I'm sure that the sentiment was there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he meant well. So now that the year is over, Oliver doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to return home. It's too messy. It's too complicated. He wants to be free. And so Felix is like, hey, I'm a mother prince. He's not a prince. He doesn't say that. But I have a castle. 
<laughs> it's called Saltburn. I'm literally titled. I don't know what he's titled. Sir or something. The Vis Viscount. Did you know it's not Viscount? For years, I've been saying Viscount. The Viscount, whatever. He's titled, he would be a part of the town. You should come to my castle. It's called Saltburn. The way they build up this trip to Saltburn, I was under the impression that it was about to be some real midsummer type culty culty. They're not gonna let me say that. Can I say culty? They won't let me say culty anymore. We used to be a country. A culty country. <laughs> Stop it. But I say all that to say that the direction it went admittedly wasn't the direction I was expecting it to go. Definitely not that. So off Oliver goes venturing into the massive courtyards of Saltburn and everything about the estate screams money, cash, title, castle, fully decked, fully equipped with a very disconcerting semi-taciturn butler who only says like three words at a time, who opens the door. And there's obviously this notable contrast with the fun loving Felix and these kind of uh, robotic helpers. But Felix is definitely there, obviously with the intention of making Oliver feel at home. He shows him around, again, the castle, apparently Henry the Eighth's castle. Real shit. Apparently still has some of Henry's on the sheets, if you look hard enough. The family, Canton family, Sir James and Els Elspeth? Elspeth. Elspeth. I'm gonna call her Elle. Canton. And Elle is played by that lady who was in I Do Care. Just dreadfully off-putting woman. Love her. She's that here too, by the way. Darkly funny, incredibly disconcerting. You know, in that way that's just posh and intangible. Awful. Horrible person. Off-putting. Lover. Elle has a friend who <laughs> in the like uh, cast is referred to as poor dear Pamela <laughs> in the credits. And Pamela is a bit eccentric, strange. I don't know if she's that strange. I think she's just very contrasted with these very like prim and proper posh people. She looks like she might be into art or something. Looks like she smokes a lot of cigarettes. Um, and maybe she knew a guy who used to be in a punk band, you know, that type of vibe. I don't know how she ended up here. Well, she ended up here to some degree because she's dating a billionaire somehow. Girl, how you do that? <sighs> I want to be Eve. She got her billionaire and you ain't seen her since unless you want to see her. Well, I will say Elle has a tendency that you can tell quite early that she seems to have this sort of a tendency to collect people as some weird means of charity. Collectors of unfortunate people, it would seem. And Oliver seemingly is one of those people. Also within the family is their daughter, uh, Felix's sister, Venetia. Pretty name, I like that, that's very cute. When Elle meets Oliver, again, she has this kind of like two-faced smiley way about her. She compliments his looks. She claims that she has had a lifelong fear of ugliness, which I thought would come up again. And it might've, but I missed it. <laughs> like I didn't get the message. And, and then she returns to her friend, Pamela, again, whose friendship is quite confusing to say the least. She has a tendency to kind of order her about, order Pamela about in a way, that shows quite subtly that there is a very distinct, strained power dynamic between the two, even within their quote unquote friendship. Again, I, I don't get the sense that they're friends. It feels like that uh, Elle is doing it as a way to, to, as some, like a donation, but not out of the goodness of your heart. You know, the ones that you do for write-offs. <laughs> like that's the feel I get from her. She also goes into how sorry she was to hear about Oliver's father. She then gossips and tells Pamela's business saying that she also struggles with addiction and that's how she's lost many, many friends, which again, okay. Are you just collecting people that are down on their luck? It feels very weird. Again, very Midsommar. I was like, hmm. It don't go the way I expected it to. After dinner, Oliver notices Venetia in the gardens in the foggy moonlight. And he goes to speak with her, thinking perhaps she was on the ground sleepwalking. But she says, no, I'm out there to see the full moon. It means that we're all about to lose our minds. <sighs> Never lied. I think the scene is more so supposed to insinuate that there's some flirtatiousness between the two of them as well. There's a few scenes that I'm still not 100% sure if there is any significance <laughs> with them, other than this one little funny thing that I saw going around on Twitter and I was like, someone understood my sentiment. But um, they talk of eggs, they talk of poets. He can't eat over easy eggs to be specific. A bunch of art 
happens. Oliver, Felix, and Farley frolic naked in the sun. Farley congratulates Oliver on his penis. Again, they have a weirdly antagonistic yet flirtatious relationship. Very weird. Eh, Not that weird. (laughs) Some of us love a good negging. It's subtle. It it needs to be not, not like, you a but like, you know, (laughs) <laughs> like under that. I think Farley's too aggressive. It would be off-putting to me, but okay. But yeah, they just have like a grand rich people summer montage playing sports, drinking. And throughout, Oliver learns things about the castle and its history. And he uses that to impress the family. They have this gargantuan maze on the grounds as well. So you may be thinking, Kendall, there's nothing that weird that happened so far. So when does it get as weird as everyone's talking about? It's probably one of these scenes. So we're entering weird scene number one. <laughs> when uh, Felix was showing Oliver the different spaces, the different rooms, and ultimately where his room would be for the summer. He told Oliver that unfortunately they would have to be sharing a bathroom because otherwise he'd have to use a bathroom that's really far away. And it's like, so we'll share this one. One night while Felix is in the bathtub, he decides to play some solo tug of war. Um, And Oliver overhears him and just kind of like creepily watches him as he does it, which is weird, which is weird, but that's not enough to cause such a hoopla. So what is the issue? (laughs) Ooh, okay, well, um, he waits until he leaves um, and he goes into the bathroom. (laughs) He goes, (laughs) he goes into the bathroom and slurps. (laughs) He goes into the bathroom and slurps up the Okay, now, 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 though disgusting, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. The thing that ended me, though, is that not only did he, you know, savor this man's bathwater essence, (laughs) he literally goes up to the drain, the rusty, I'm sure I can't show you any of (laughs) it. He goes up to the rusty drain and starts tonguing the bathtub's booty hole. was built in the 17th century. Do you know how disgusting it is? <laughs> this bathtub is as old as inside plumbing. And you tongue in the booty hole of a bath that Henry the eighth. Ah! Can you get tetanus just on your tongue? To me, that was way gross. That was way grosser than the water, which is still not great. It's not, I mean, No, I'm not going to try to justify. It's gross. <laughs> but now I will say, though, as gross as that is, I get it. Hold on. Let me finish. <laughs> Let me finish. Let me finish. Again, not that I think that the drinking of the water is like, I get it. Like, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> like, I, wow, that actually makes me feel more guilty by saying that as opposed to like, obviously, <laughs> you're not drinking. <clears throat> I get what this is supposed to mean, is what I'm saying. Like, it's supposed to be like a glimpse into Oliver, right? The desperation of this person. (laughs) To literally consume the very essence of what makes these people who they are. I had a teacher in college, wow. Hi, if you watching this, don't you love what I became? Um, I'm gonna quote you, uh, ironically. So he had a teacher in college who was talking about how, I forget the specifics, something, something, Korean Buddhism, something, something, semen is essence. And so now whenever I see something in relation to male sperm, I always think like, oh, it's the men, it's the essence. (laughs) It's the very essence. So if you think of it in that context, it literally is you trying to savor the very essence of Felix, of of the alpha of this this desperation follow me follow me like it's a it's an obsession so um desperate and unyielding gross <laughs> like this is a getting a bit ahead of myself but this is one of the issues i have about this scene it's not the scene itself it's that how did we get here every time <laughs> a new like level of outrageousness happens in this movie. I feel like we've missed some steps because yeah, we knew that he liked being friends with Felix. We didn't know he was at the point he drinking his 
some water. Like, hello. Granted, I don't know what like incremental steps you can do to make the water not seem weird. It just came out of nowhere. And up until this point, we haven't seen him be that desperate to be a part of this. We've seen like little small things like learning about the house and stuff like that to, to kind of impress his like parents, but nothing like this. But here we are. It's really jarring and arguably unearned if there is a way to earn uh, drinking bath water. But anyway, later we uh, meet Elle again and her and Oliver speak alone. And in this context, she's gossiping about Venetia. She's a horrible gossip, Elle. She has a tendency to ask everyone their business and then she spreads said business around. This time she tells Oliver that Venetia is sexually incontinent and has bulimia. Thanks. The f she also says that uh, Pamela is gone, <laughs> which is funny because there was a scene earlier where Pamela had said she had gotten a flat. And prior to that, the family was like, oh, you could stay as long as you want. But they were like, oh, we know you must go. And she's like, well, I could stay a little. Long. No, you can go. You, we would never want to hold you back. It's OK. You can go. So at this point off camera, they've kicked her out of the house. And uh, Elle is like, there's only so many hints you can give. Yeah, she talks shit about Pamela a lot, about everyone, a lot, which seems to just be a reoccurring thing for her. She's like, on the surface, she's, you know, sweet and demure, posh. If you actually listen to the substance of what she's saying, she's not a particularly nice person. She's quite awful, actually. Hearing that um, Elle has some tension with Pamela, for whatever reason, Oliver seems to want to jump in on that, planting some seeds of doubt about Pamela, that perhaps she's a user and emotional blackmailer. I don't know why he would do this like what is his motivation to do this to like badmouth a person who's already left the house and if in like if he was trying to like gain favor with the family i don't understand how this does it she's not even there anymore and also too i don't know why l believes him but she does and she's like oh wow thank you i'm so grateful for you I don't know, but so weird scenes, yeah. So this is the second one that I assume people are talking about. And this is when Oliver sees Venetia out in the gardens again. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I want to go about the, talking about the scene. Should I like build up to it or should I just rip the bandaid off? Okay, he eats her while she's on her period. Again, there's a whole buildup about taking care of yourself and keeping her food down because she has bulimia, but it, all of that isn't what you'll remember. <laughs> it, and also it's not what you want my reaction to, right? It's to the vampire. <laughs> like, uh, again, gross. Um, again, I get it. It's a similar thing to the, the drain thing. It's him literally and figuratively being a bloodsucker. <laughs> Still gross, even though I get it. I guess, uh, in the other direction, if you think of as the essence of male reproductive then the period is the other aspect of it. So again, he's trying to feast on their very, their very birthright? <laughs> Gross. But it's not fun to sit there and watch. I, I'm, you know, I'm sitting there watching him sucking out her clots like Boba. And I was, I'm sorry, that's, oh God. Um, How you doing? Checking in. How you feeling? You okay? We got this. We're through the first two of I don't, I, probably four scenes. And these are definitely the worst ones. So if you survive this, you'll make it through, baby. You got this, BB. You got this. So he's eating her pussy outside for everyone to see if you open your window. And so Farley sees them and he's like, oh my God, you stupid little boy. So he goes and tells Felix. And so the next day there's this like unspoken uncomfortableness at the table. Like Felix notices if Oliver and Venetia have any like passes at each other, but they don't say anything because instead the parents are deciding that they want to throw Oliver a birthday party. Invite a hundred or 200 of your friends. Who the f has 200 friends, which is basically the face he makes. Who the f know 200 people that they would call a friend? What the hell? So later, again, Felix is frustrated and annoyed that Oliver had anything to do with his sister. And so Oliver lies and says that Venetia came on to him. She was drunk and he just politely steered her away and he didn't want to bring it up because he didn't want to embarrass her. <sighs> 
Some of y'all are real good liars. I can't think that quickly on my feet. And Felix seems to be open to that um, and also says that in the past, Venetia had hooked up with some of his friends in the past and that had actually ruined their friendship. And so he just didn't want that to happen again. Farley, again, having this like vague animosity towards everybody, him and Felix actually get into it because Farley feels like they're using money that could be going to his mom, but she lives in squalor and they're using that to throw a birthday party for Oliver. And the way that Felix has it set up or thinks about it. He's like, we want her to get on her own two feet, you know, pull herself up by her bootstraps or whatever the f And Farley is like, you do see that how this looks right, insinuating he's the only black person in their family and you're making him come here and beg <laughs> for what's a part of his birthright. And this leaves Felix aghast. He's like, oh, the very notion that the British, the titled British are racist? And of course, the squabble Oliver overhears. At dinner, Venetia asks if Felix had warned Oliver away from her. And she says that Oliver is just another one of his toys. So we're hearing this reoccurring theme that Felix has a tendency to collect people, maybe much like his mom, and plays with them and discards them. So I'm like, ooh, okay. Midsommar, uh, cult, being fake and con collecting people and throwing them away, okay. I don't know what I'm looking out for. Oliver and Farley talk as the family sings karaoke, having like a dinner or something. And as they're there, again, there's this charged sexual but antagonistic vibe between the two. And Oliver is like, why did you tell Felix about me and Venetia? And he's like, you can talk to me about things. You don't have to go behind my back. I know things are hard at home. And again, in any other context, you would think that this would be like giving an olive branch over, but there's again, this antagonistic yet sexual competition -y feeling between the two. So maybe because they're both kind of clawing for respectability, I guess, in this home, even though one guy isn't family at all and one of them is family, but he's black. So, you know, that puts you down several rungs on the ladder. And also his mom is in squalor because she ran away to America. Farley decides to then set up the karaoke to sing a song called Rent, which is a song about someone who wants to be taken care of by someone else financially. And in return, they'll be their puppet or their plaything. Again, referencing how people feel that Felix treats people. And he sets it up for Oliver to sing it. And once the lyrics get a bit too real, he turns over to Farley and is like, oh, this is your song as well. And he's happy to come there and finish it better than Oliver ever did. Then later in his room, he punches a mirror in frustration, Oliver does. He's, he's been out done. He's been had, I don't know. So I guess in order to get back at Farley, he goes into his room in the middle of the night and gets on top of him, grabs his dick and tells him to behave. Kinky. No, I'll just say I'm not sure to what degree this is um, consensual. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Farley seems to be into it, but also we don't hear him say, oh yeah, or anything. <laughs> so, but I think they f So the next morning, Farley is shooed from the house after being accused of stealing. And Felix seems to believe that he did that, but Venetia seems to be skeptical. But as the children and Oliver are talking it over, out comes the parents who, much as always, when things are wrong, they come out cheery and blissful about the weather, as if nothing had happened, as if they weren't just in a screaming argument with Farley and had to kick out a family member. Um, and this is doubly strange because within this scene, we find out that Pamela has died and Elle as opposed to being grief stricken by that fact that her best friend had been killed by her addiction or whatever, she's just annoyed that she has to go to London for the funeral and says that Pamela would do anything for attention, dying included. <laughs> it's now Oliver's birthday and Felix has decided to surprise him with a road trip for said birthday. And where is this road trip going to take place? Oliver's hometown. Apparently, Felix had answered his phone when his mother had called and she sounded sober. So he wanted to give Oliver a chance to speak with her. And at first, I thought this was like coming off as like a Pamela situation where they're trying to nicely push him out of the house. Perhaps they've grown tired of Oliver or wanted to set him up somewhere else. But uh, as the scene continues, I think it's just so that we could find out that Oliver has lied about his family entirely. They're not addicts. They aren't broke. They're pretty comfortably middle class, maybe upper middle class. His daddy ain't dead. He has siblings. 
He's been lying about everything. Damn. He's also been lying to his parents, it seems, telling them that he's the top scholar at Oxford and part of the rowing team. <laughs> DeSantis over here. No, not DeSantis. Santos. And Felix is, you know, polite to learn this information, but he, you could feel his silent anger the, all the ride back to Saltburn. And so Felix says, I think you should go back home after your party and I'll just see you back at Oxford. So, and we start to see that desperation from Oliver. He's like, will we still be friends? And Felix is like, it's hard to say. Cause you're a f weirdo, like it's weird. So Oliver cries in his bed and prepares for the night. And the party is filled with people that Oliver doesn't know and who don't know Oliver. Farley is there for some reason, even though he just got kicked out of the house, they still invited him over. And Farley taunts Oliver about how, no matter how often, they kick me out. This is my life. Like to you, this is a dream summer. It's something you remember. It's something you tell your kids about. It's something you, you jack off to in the middle of the night. But to me, it's my life. It's my birthright. It's my family. This is my house. And I will always come back. And there's, again, this insinuation, like you will never replace me, ever. Oliver has his cake. They sing happy birthday to him, but they don't know his name at his own party. And this seems to help him reach a resolution to some degree to focus in on Felix, who up until this point was his only escape from loneliness. So he sees that Felix, who hasn't wanted to talk to him all night, is going off with a girl into the maze on the grounds um, and he goes to follow him, breaking them up um, when they were, you know, getting busy. Oliver goes up to him drunk horribly drunk, begging him not to throw him away. He played his part as Felix's toy as much as everyone else does. He loves him and he was his only friend. Felix is done. <laughs> and so he just hands him the bottle that he has. Oliver hands Felix the bottle and goes and runs in the corner to vomit. And Felix then drinks after him. Oliver takes the bottle back, leaving, saying, I don't care what you think anymore. After such a delightful party, imagine the surprise when no one can find Felix in the morning. So the whole house is going on an entire search of the estate looking for where Felix had gone. Everyone's starting to get more in a frenzy and progressively more nervous about it. Only for Felix's body to be found in the maze. He's a fallen angel being looked down upon by the devil statue who has horns like Oliver had, you know, keep up. There's also other scenes with the statues like looming over the back. Like we, I saw, I saw what you did there movie art. Like when Oliver and Elle were talking and he was trying to like whisper in her ear. If you see in the back, there's another statue of somebody beating out of somebody. <sighs> anyway, the police come to examine the body while the parents have strange pleasantries about the party <laughs> from Night before. They're trying, I guess, as usual, to ignore the, the the issues at hand. Farley seems to be the only person that's wanting to be honest, <laughs> honestly, honest with his emotions and honest about how awful of a situation this is. This is weird. He's like, he's dead. Why are we talking about a party? Why is Oliver still here? Like, is this not weird to y'all? And Oliver is like, I get that you feel guilty, Farley. I would if I was doing coke the night that someone died at a party. Now, mind you, was he doing coke? Yes. What the f*** that has to do with Felix dying? Not a damn thing. But they use that to search his room and kick him out for good this time. So they have his funeral. They write his name on the stone, throw it in the river. You know the whole thing. They bury the body. Scene three. <laughs> the third one that is probably... It's raining. The, the ground is still soft. They just buried him. Oliver is crying like, oh my God, he's dead. Because uh -huh, uh -huh. Oliver usually takes things just a little farther than necessary. Um, he f***s it. He f***s the grave. Like he gets naked. He puts his dick in the dirt and he, and he f***s it. Back at the house, <laughs> family seems to have finally decided to act like f***ing human beings. They're having some grief peek through. It's very weird. Elle, grief stricken from losing her son, insists that Oliver does not leave Saltburn, which he doesn't want to leave anyway. But she's like, you can't leave us now, especially because, you know, you were one of his closest friends, you know, please don't leave. And, it, and it's pretty obvious that she seems to have 
projected some of her feelings about her son, her grief towards her son, her missing her son onto Oliver as he was his closest friend, real Evan Hansen type beat. Venetia goes and takes a bath in the bathtub that Oliver shared with Felix. And she is sobbing, drunk, going from one side or another of the pendulum, crying, angry, laughing. She's in hysterics. She says that she saw him crying in the back of the church, sobbing. She's like, and then I started laughing because I realized you knew him for what? Six months? All this happened in six months? Damn, I see why you hate him. You a bad omen. She's like, you have nothing to do with us. You are a stranger. And yet here you are right in the middle of it all. You're like a moth, harmless, quiet, drawn to shiny things. You're so desperate to get in. And then she gets angry because she can smell that Oliver has been using Felix's aftershave. And then Oliver kisses her for some reason. And she's like, oh, ah. eventually she starts kissing him at first. And then she's like, oh, and then like draws away. So back to the first scene of the movie. Remember he was talking to somebody off screen? Through narration, Oliver says that Felix's death must have broken her. And then they show her dead in the bathtub of an apparent Sue of side. And they throw her stone, the one with her name on it, and toss it in the river. Now with both of their children dead in a very short amount of time, Sir James asks Oliver to leave. Again, the bad omen. He leaves a bad, bad things. <laughs> and Oliver says that he would love to go, he really would, but I just can't. My good conscience wouldn't let me to leave Elspeth, Elspeth, El, in her time of need. So you want money, is what you're saying. I'll give you whatever you want, money-wise. And Oliver seems perplexed by the insinuation that he's trying to stay for money, but eventually he's ushered out all the same, presumably with a large sum, but we never find out for sure. Fast forward and it's years later, presumably present day. He sees in the paper that Sir James has died. And afterwards, he also conveniently runs into Elle in a cafe, who is now completely alone at Saltburn. And when she sees him, she's incredibly overtaken. She, you know, still thinks of him, I would think as, you know, a connection to her children. She asks that he forgive Sir James, the late Sir James at this point, for how he treated him. And she invites him back to Saltburn. And at this point, we return to the beginning of the movie. Recall, he was talking to someone off screen about whether or not he loved Felix. Well, the person he was talking to, all this time I thought he was talking to a therapist because God knows he needs one. Um, No, he was actually talking to Elle, who's unconscious because she's on a ventilator. <laughs> dying of a serious and unknown illness. <laughs> this, of course, happens after he conveniently coerces her to sign over Saltburn to him when she's like basically incapacitated. And in this final few minutes, the movie insinuates that this has been like some incredible long con of Oliver's to get the attention of Felix to infiltrate the estate, to finally climb up the social ladder, to become the owner of Saltburn because he loved Felix, but he also hated him. And he even stole his rock out of the river. He hated all them mother It would seem that Oliver actually poisoned Felix. He staged Venetia's suicide. And his final act is to rip the intubation tube out of Elle's throat um, and she dies. And then once she's gone dead and limp, he tries to get her to hug him. It's very sad, sad motherfucker. Anyway, and finally we have scene four that people were talking about, not nearly again as gross as one and two. It's the final scene in which Oliver, finally successful of getting his hands on this estate, dances around said estate, but naked swinging as Murder on the Dance Floor plays. This was a scene that a lot of people were talking about because he, you see his and that's nice, I guess. But people were acting like he had a schlong. They were acting like he had this massive and that is a normal penis. That is a very like nine to five He don't do no extracurriculars with that. That's a very office job. No offense to office job. 
Well, I guess you can have a big dick and work at Office Max or something. I don't know. I say, oh, that's to say it's a very normal penis. Probably like, what, five, six inches? Maybe five and a half inches. The movie ends with him taking all of the stones (laughs) out of the river and dances in front of this sort of like puppet show of a family thing that I suppose is supposed to represent the family itself. And that is Saltburn. Not bad. 7.5 out of 10. Not bad. It's a goodish movie with great performances, great cinematography, overall interesting premise that kept me intrigued and disgusted. Um, But I do have some critiques about the movie and namely that the movie felt incomplete to me. Did anybody else get that? Or or are we all just uh, distracted by the disgusting I was like, sure, I can reach some sort of deduction on why broadly someone from a comfortable middle class upbringing would be interested in climbing the social ladder that little bit higher. You know, it's your proximity. You're this close to being rich. And you, like you can see it, you can taste it. You're around, surrounded by people who have achieved it. So, you know, I get how that would make you maybe start your grind, but I don't <laughs> get how it made you obsessed enough to drink his bath water and tongue a tub's booty hole. That's weird. Sucking the whole iron out of her coochie. She's anemic now. Poor thing. You're f-ing a grave. Baby, you didn't build us up for this. Like, I, do, I don't, we didn't earn this. Some people were saying that the dancing around the thing was, um... Er, it wasn't earned. I think that was fine. Have y'all ever felt freedom? Have y'all ever been alone in your house? Baby, there's nothing better than just walking around that bitch naked. I do it all the time. I get that very visceral glee of like claiming this area. It's like the human equivalent of pissing on the couch. This is mine. You know, I get it. But everything else just felt like, how did we get here again? Like I get what the shocking moments are meant to represent. At least I think I do. Again, consuming the very essence to such a disturbing amount of adoration and desperation. But I don't feel like they ever really gave us a good reason why. They didn't delve enough into his past to insinuate how we got here, how we got to this level of fervor, you know? Like his parents say in passing that he was lonely growing up, but like, how lonely? How did we get here? Like he had trouble making friends growing up, you know? But yeah, you gotta explain to me how we got here because I just feel like was happening. There's also just little things that we never really answer, or if we did, I didn't catch it. Again, there's all this insinuation that <sighs> Felix throws people away. He, You're one of his toys. He's gonna throw you away. Was that a red herring? Or I think so, because we're not supposed to expect Oliver to be the mastermind or something, but, but it just felt like a poorly thought out red herring. And then there's just other random things like what was his mom's thing with ugliness and facial hair? Why did Felix just casually say that he accidentally fingered his cousin? Why can't Oliver eat runny eggs? Uh, shout outs to uh, Iowa Debris because she definitely vocalized my confusion uh, in that. I don't know. It just felt like we didn't explain enough. It felt like we didn't explain enough of what was going on to justify what was going on. <laughs> but it, it, it's a fine movie. Again, 7.5 out of 10. That's not bad. It's, uh, B minus C plus. Is it as crazy as everyone thought? Again, I don't know if it was because it was spoiled for me. And I've just seen a lot of weird shit in the last few. I've seen a lot of weird shit and read a lot of weird shit. Again, American Psycho book. Whew. It gave me nightmares. I had a distinct nightmare from it. And I've never had that happen from any horror media. So visceral, disgusting. I was expecting something much worse, maybe <laughs> because of that. Yeah. It's fine. I wanna know, what were your thoughts on it? Did you have any like precursors? Did you know what you were walking into? How did you react to the scenes? I laughed. <laughs> I was like, the But that's all for today, folks. If you liked today's video, feel free to like today's video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. Feel free to check me out on my podcasts that I co-host called Connect the Dots. We're interviewing like real celebrities. There's a few on the list. I would have already filmed it by the time you see this, but there's some in the stock that I, there are two people that they have on the list that I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? One person came out of nowhere and I'm so excited. They are a part of my childhood in a very ghetto way. <laughs> can't wait to meet them but if you will check out any of the episodes that are already up i'll link that down below if you have any movies that you think i should watch or review anything that you think i should make a video on put that down in the comment section and i will see you guys next time